All right, we're now live for another live reading from my book, uh, Reason Fulfilled by Revelation, the 1930s Christian Philosophy Debates in France, published in 2011, containing a number of translated documents from the Christian philosophy debates, and my uh, roughly 100-page historical and thematic introduction, and then a extensive bibliography that was current back in 2011, and of course is not today, <laughs> except for going back to the 1920s and 1930s. So this is the second to last session, and we're going to be reading from the final Maurice Blondel piece. There's four pieces by Maurice Blondel in this uh, volume, in part because he was one of the most overlooked, uh, untranslated members of the debate. I didn't actually translate everything that he wrote. There's other things as well. But we're going to be looking at his Foreign Integral Philosophy, published in the review Neoscholastique de Philosophie. If you remember last session, we read Fernand von Steinbergen's uh, piece also published in Review Neoscholastique de Philosophie. And then next week, we'll be finishing up by reading Leon Noel's The Notion of Christian Philosophy, also published in that same journal, which you can tell assumed an, a significant importance during the debates later on. So uh, good to see you here, Mark. And uh, hey, hello to everybody else. Um, so let me jump then to page 260 in the text. And this is a, um, there we go. This is a 1934 piece. So we're getting close to the end point of the debates in 1936. Maurice Blondel, Foreign Integral Philosophy. Mr. Fernand von Steinbergen's vigorous article seems to be of the right sort to clarify the formulation of a problem so complex that it has perhaps been a mistake to call it the problem of, quote, Christian philosophy, a term that is highly equivocal in the use that has been made of it and that stricto sensu remains inevitably hybrid. That author, by the conciseness of his criticism, and the direct character of his own assertions usefully dispels certain misunderstandings and raises some reflections, certainly of profit to many. In many of the objections he sets forth and the desiderata that he expresses, he seems to me to concur, if not with the formulation he gives his thoughts, at least with the basic exigencies justifying his severity. Still, though, since his critiques and assertions seem to me at times unjustified or capable of false applications, it will undoubtedly be useful to discuss certain theses that one by one seem to augment or lessen the truth of what we may still, despite everything, call, quote, Catholic philosophy. Number one. First, a preparatory remark that, although it seems only to touch on a question of terminology, already contains an early indication of the confusions from which we need to free ourselves, in place of a mingling of words that, not without reason, he judges equivocal and formally erroneous, Mr. von Steinbergen substitutes another expression. In place of Christian philosophy, he proposes philosophy of Christianity. Let us examine this suggestion, which in the recent debates and among so many attempts aimed at more closely grasping the solution's correct formula, is offered to us for the first time. This appellation proposed in order to avoid an ambiguity, is it not just as ambiguous as the one it would replace? It seems that it admits of two completely different meanings and, I add from this point on, two meanings just as denaturing to the doctrine that one aims thereby to safeguard. By the analogies that he invokes, philosophy of science, philosophy of history, of religion, etc., our author inclines us to interpret the word so associated as if it were a matter of ref reflection on the Christian religion considered from the outside and without an internal relation with the specific content of revelation. But aside from the fact that the term philosophy of history is poorly thought of at present because the speculations placed under its rubric were shown 
more and more to falsify history without contributing any philosophical illumination or certainty, the analogous expression proposed to us is even more hybrid, more compromising for the object. It is charged with designating with a clarity that will legitimate this expression. Such an expression, simply from the rational point of view, would it not deserve at all the discredit with which the philosophy of history is rightly tarred, a philosophy that lived or died by tendentious considerations, no longer those of impartial history, nor a philosophy organized in a technical and professional manner. Can the rational and completely extrinsic examination of the gospel message of supernatural truths, of Christian life in the church, or in souls, respect both the specifically divine character of Christianity and the completely human character of philosophy? Do not the ambiguities certain historians of metaphysical thought are criticized for turn up multiplied here, by the very fact that philosophy is explicitly called upon to consider the Christian religion as a contingent and historical datum by heaping up extrinsic considerations that cannot possibly ascend to the Christian religion without forcing it to descend to the level of natural facts and without even attempting the least speculative penetration. No doubt this restriction prevents confusion, but whether one would like it or not, it consecrates separation. But one will respond. Does not the contested expression admit of a more intrinsic meaning, a direct fundamental critical examination of Christian data that reason would consider from its autonomous point of view? Does such an interpretation distinguish itself from the historical or historicist theses that Mr. von Steinbergen has demolished with a correct and penetrating severity? From such a perspective, either philosophy commits suicide by placing itself in vassalage to what we must call the not only transcendent, as, as such philosophy calls it, but specifically supernatural character of positive religion, or it is Christianity that succumbs by allowing itself to be sliced up and assimilated by a critique applied to dogma, to Christ, to the church setting aside whatever, by hypothesis, and, by hypothesis and definition, remains incommensurable with philosophy and in its supernatural reality, inaccessible to consciousness's direct observation, as well as to reason's verdict. In both of these possible interpretations, the recently proposed mixture of words seems more than deficient. And if some people have come to suggest and be content with them, Perhaps it is because, despite well-favored efforts to approach the question center, the vital point where all the difficulties to be resolved are bound together in a knot has not yet been concisely perceived nor truly touched on. Two, rather than seeking partial concordances or even rational superimpositions and coincidences between a philosophy and a Christianity that, after being encountered in a contingent way, would get boxed up one inside the other by alternatively using them as content or container, it is, on the contrary, a matter of constantly laying out and safeguarding this double truth without ever taking anything away from it, without concealing any of it, and without forgetting any of it. On the one hand, between the Christian order and the philosophical order, there is an essential incommensurability, one such that reason could never discover, exhaust, perceive, assimilate, or substitute for the mystery of truth and grace that is hidden in history and that the gift of the Redeemer makes universally radiate. On the other hand, whether in the absence of known revelation or under the light of divine teaching, philosophy, which cannot penetrate the secret of the supernatural order, can still, however, prepare the dispositions required so that entrance to the invisible soul of the church remains open to all. Through the intellectual, moral, and religious preparations that its mission is to illuminate and to verify as if in the role of precursor, Philosophy has the duty to maintain ready and free the place of waiting or possession only Christianity deserves and fills. How can we not see how much the true problem is denatured by putting philosophy and Christianity 
into competition, so to speak, as if the former had to supply or submit to the positively supernatural fullnesses religion provides or imposes, when it is really a matter, if one may say this, of a double emptiness to prepare. For, quote, God loves empty vessels, empty and pure, so he can enter there. And God, according to St. John's expression, emptied himself, as it were, so that we could enter into him by restoring to him with full offering of ourselves that part of divinity he has lent us with the alternative of a possible deicide or of a union transformative even to the point of theosis. There is therefore a radical impossibility of confusing philosophies and Christianity's roles, and in fact the attempt at a rational concordism is absolutely chimerical and deadly when substituted for the search for a mutual compenetration and union in the most jealously maintained incommensurability. Such an unconfusability is of metaphysical necessity, and to not bring it up at the beginning of the problem to be resolved is not only to close off the entry door, but to run into an impenetrable wall. Three. Assuredly, Mr. von Steinbergen does not at all intend to misrecognize the reservations I have just pointed out, nor to confine himself to a fixture of more or less superimposable or interchangeable concepts. He protests strongly against the attitude of certain philosophers of history who take a per peculiar position by conceiving a philosophy in itself stabilized and closed off notions, seeking their ideological constructs material solely in the past, as if what lived no longer had any need to live and to move through present or future initiatives. Simply from reason's point of view, can we call intelligible and satisfactory a metaphysics drawn up short at the always deficient idea we have of God, a certainty whose firmness would be without any internal dynamism, an aspiration that would not move toward beatitude? Also, despite the strange assertion of certain philosophers who acknowledge the, quote, insufficiency of philosophy without accepting a philosophy of insufficiency, it is possible to show the verbal and chimerical nature of such a distinction, which far from penetrating to the ground of things, risks, despite denials to the contrary, leading us into a separated philosophy, self-sufficing and excluding any conception or any welcoming of the supernatural. Let us rejoice, then, to hear Mr. von Steinbergen state that philosophy is not a closed circle in the order of beings, of reason, of intelligible possibilities, or essential necessities. For, he says, quote, philosophy is the scientific effort which aims at general explanation of the real. And to better indicate that even in this very reality, philosophy does not ignore concrete elements partly escaping through their condition as individual or through their transcendence, the science of the general, he admits, as Father Sertiange and I had asked, that philosophy is not only insufficient and far from being stabilized, but also capable of justifying and using this given fact in order to raise it to a norm and establish a philosophy of insufficiency. Only, it is not enough to accept this assertion in principle, nor to leave it among all the other concepts in the inert condition of a general and static thesis, since it is aroused by the total dynamism of the human being, and since it is the expression of a congenital and incoercible desire in every created mind. So different recent critiques, not that of Mr. von Steinbergen, remove from this acknowledgement its stimulating and salutary virtue, setting it out like a nightlight, or even extinguishing it by avoiding seeing whence it comes and whither it goes and integrating it in philosophical thought's own life. They do not notice that they annihilate it by going back to just to seeking out notions common to theology and philosophy. And in place of the living problem of the relations between philosophy's goal and the drive from which inquiry proceeds along with the demands of religious aspiration and supernatural vocation, they substitute the abstract relation of two competencies, two disciplines considered in a completely formal manner on the ground of abstract knowledges and methods to be distinguished. 
Doubtless these analyses are legitimate and even necessary, but philosophical criteriology is not the living thought that animates philosophy and sets it within a drama any more than theology is the Christianity vivifying souls and bearing salutary truths, divine demands, and eternal responsibilities. It is there, however, that the problem to be resolved resides, a problem whose aspects critical reflection will have to analyze, but without reflection by itself procuring its effective solution. Still, must we restrict the solution only to this simple opening that, theoretically in the order of possibilities, rational speculations in sufficiency, faced with a certain notion of God, with our ignorance of our final destiny, with our vague aspiration towards beatitude, imposes on us? It is here that I no longer quite understand how Mr. von Steinbergen maintains coherence between these affirmations. He has insisted on the extension of philosophical doctrine to all the real. Then he restricts the scope of rational speculation to the domain of concepts, of essences, of possibilities, of metaphysical necessities. And it is from that point on that he, just as much as anyone else, begins to eliminate the study of the historical, psychological, moral, and religious facts as if philosophy went outside of its own power and its duty by going beyond the analysis of the state of pure nature in order to research whether in the concrete order something other than the perfect autonomy of a state of nature be found. A state that not only has not existed and does not exist, but that an essentially philosophical matter cannot be conceived as a final fixed state in any created mind. While arming ourselves better than many have done against the deformation or mutilation that Thomism suffers from that point on when one eliminates the reality of the dynamism intrinsic to every mind is eliminated, and from that point on when the intellect is fixed in its concept of God, this other scholar, without realizing it, returns to the idea of a philosophy restricted to concepts and to concepts restricted to logically defined contours, but contours foreign to the domain of concrete existences, of life in movement, of real infinitude, even if it be that of God who always remains beyond our ideas and our grasps. At that point, after having accepted the notion and legitimacy of a philosophy of insufficiency, he reduces this assertion to something purely static, conceptual, and even negative. It seems to him that after having admitted its rational powerlessness, there is nothing more to do than to halt philosophy at the threshold of a naturally obscure and unsoundable abyss. He does not envision the possibility of considering the gap that the admission of our deficiencies implies as a positive state, as the expression of a presence, of a power, of a duty of our thought, interiorly belabored by a very real aspiration, by a historically set out vocation, or even by a stimulating and undeclinable grace. From such a point of view, what does it become? The teaching brought back to light, the teaching of the desiderium naturale vivendi deum, from which not only the patristic tradition, but the scholastic tradition draws inspiration. Four. One might still object that under the pretext of not confusing theological synthesis with Christian reality, we ought not identify philosophy with the rational life, nor attribute it to it the value of a drama, since in place of a denouement, it has only a theoretical explanation to offer and a logical and metaphysical ordering to establish. But through this resistance, useful for preventing deplorable confusions, we risk falling back again into that narrow conception we claim to exclude and exceed, the conception of a system of ideas that deliberately leave outside their embrace this living and concrete reality that we had promised not to neglect. To take account of this, we do not in any way have to identify philosophy with lived and thought reality. Entirely to the contrary, we insist on the inadequation between philosophical science and concrete reality, vast enough and complex enough so that the order of nature does not remain essentially impenetrable to stimulations of a superior order. This is why we speak of a philosophy of insufficiency in a more precise, more 
positive sense than as if for the human mind it was a matter of a pure nature that in actuality has never existed, and this for a double reason. For no spiritual creature can remain fixed and satisfied by what it knows of itself and of God without being belabored by a natural desire reasonable and inefficacious to reach God and beatitude. Also, and still more, man, originally invited and called by redemptive charity to a supernatural destiny, cannot be complacent in an only apparent, com apparently complete and comprehensive realism that would eliminate the psychological, <clears throat> moral, and religious realities resonating, even if only anonymously. At the bottom of even the most ignorant consciousnesses, according to one of Deschamps' remarks. Mr. Von Steinbergen rightly <clears throat> explains to us that beyond a theology strictly confined to the rational organization of the truths of faith, there is what he names a broad theology that embraces and dominates in an immense intellectual synthesis all of the lights and the living forces of general civilization. Nothing better if in the name of a summa constituted as a function of the instruments prepared by human culture, he retains the plasticity of an organism that assimilates its feedings and renewals necessary at every age of life. But conversely, since he recognizes philosophy's spontaneity and autonomy, he doubtless also admits for it the good of a growth, of a broadening capable of digesting and enlivening more and more widely extended acquisitions. Precisely because we have shown that even in theses, reason, and revelation work on simultaneously, there is a total heterogeneity of origin, method, of scope, of spirit. We need not fear collisions and confusions. For philosophy has only to remain faithful to its light, courageous and conquering in its line of aim, as true and as complete and comprehensive as possible, in order to sustain, if one may say so, the development that in a different plane theology, whether strict or broad, pursues without impatiently seeking an imposed concordism. From such a point of view, certain criticisms that Mr. von Steinbergen addresses to an article published in V on Selectual do not seem valid against the Reverend Father Sertiange's central thesis. They would bear against him only to the degree to which his urbanity seems to agree to certain concessions to the theses, shifting in any case of certain uh, of this debate's protagonists. But from that point on, when one recognizes philosophy's legitimate extension to the entire range of the real, not only of an ideal being, but of a psychological and historical concrete, it then seems consequent and even indispensable to attribute to this complete and working philosophy a triple field of study without which far from fulfilling its normal and beneficial function, it runs the risk, and we with it and through it, of instituting between it and Christianity, not a regime of alliance or of union, but of tendencies oscillating back and forth between usurpations, conflicts, separations, and exclusions. Five, what seems to make all of our controversies obscure and to lead, uh, leave us into an inextricable confusion is the temptation to juxtapose totally heterogeneous data without going back up, back and up to the dominating principle that alone can prepare and realize union without confusion of philosophy, history, dogma, and Christian life. Each of these elements admits of being studied under two aspects, and the equivocation that must be everywhere destroyed is that which would identify the historical fact in time and space with the supertemporal and extraspatial act from which Christianity is essentially constituted. It is through this reality, antecedent to facts, and visible to discursive thought, transcendent to metaphysical reality itself, that we must gain access to the center of perspective outside of which everything remains mixed up and insoluble in the living problem of our unique and indeclinable destiny, a problem from which philosophy cannot be totally dispossessed, but which cannot present itself to philosophy except under an aspect completely different from that of facts understood in space and time, from ideas analyzed and organized by the understanding, from simply psychological and social considerations. This is why the order according to which one approaches the different data of the problem is of sovereign importance for the solution's value. This sort of organization and subordination, it seems, has not been sufficiently taken into account. 
judge, juxtaposing the heterogeneous data of the most complex of problems, therefore, is not sufficient. By such a method, one can only oscillate between a confused reconciliation and distinctions transforming themselves into cloistering separations. This isolation, just as much as this fusion, leaves us in every case in the unexplained and the extrinsic. In order to take account of religious demands, of metaphysical precisions, of historical data, of psychological and moral experiences, how can philosophy proceed <clears throat> without compromising the meaning of its research, the forward movement of its inquiry, the scope of its conclusions? Three levels seem necessary to cross through, not at all by an arbitrary succession, but according to Bacon's expression, uh, per gratis debitos. A. Let us first render satisfaction to the legitimate need and to the traditional effort of a metaphysical speculation that dominates all conceivable hypotheses. What are the necessary conditions that render possible the existence and the destiny of minds? This study of intrinsic necessities and consequently of realizable possibilities excludes the errors on which the most autonomous philosophy renders its just verdict. In this way, room is made for truths that, while often unrecognized, are subjacent to every fundamentally true doctrine, a real distinction between the essence and the existence in every creature, even the most spiritual one, the truth of creation that, completely unrecognized by the ancients, does not allow itself to be does not allow itself not to be rationally accessible. The ability and the duty for the mind to recognize that God is, just as to affirm also that he is our principle, our end, the desirable source of happiness. Admission of incommensurability between God and the creature and consequently natural inaccessibility for man to the union and assimilation with God. So many truly philosophical assertions prepare or even impose the idea of a supernatural as desirable, obscurely, and inefficaciously wished for as it is conceivable. Will we deny that in an autonomous way, intellectual speculation opens up the empty space very usefully, and that if revelation can serve as a ramp, it is not revelation that supplies the strength nor sets one climbing the stairs? And we understand that in agreement with tradition, eminent theologians indicate, quote, the place of the supernatural in philosophy under a doubtless indeterminate, but still very character characterized form. In this way, even in the order of essential possibilities and metaphysical necessities, the idea of a philosophy stabilized in concepts is absolutely untenable. One can affirm it only in a purely terminological manner by taking words that seem clear and by imagining in them limits that materialize spiritual realities and God. B. But from the moment when the most autonomous and the most developed philosophy is led rationally to recognize man's powerlessness, both to limit his drive toward infinity and to arrive at the possession of this supreme object, can we render ourselves disinterested in the question of knowing whether, in fact, the idea of the supernatural responding to this normal need is accessible by grace if a real access has been gratuitously and historically given by God, if the truth of a revelation and of a divine elevation of man can be envisaged, recognized, utilized, without that reality once proposed or even imposed encountering any legitimate opposition and philosophical reason? And since Mr. Van Steenbergen declares that philosophy actually has complete and comprehensive reality for its object, must he not logically make in some way the historical, moral, supernatural truth of living Christianity enter into the philosophical organism itself? Let us remark here that it is not under its empirical aspect that the Christian teaching integrates it itself within philosophical thought, but by what is always mysterious in its supernatural formality. For insofar as supernatural, the supernatural is never perceived by consciousness nor discerned by reflection, itself always incapable of reconnecting the anonymous fact of consciousness to the dogmatic aspect and to the intimate action of grace. If there is then a marriage of nature and of Christ, it is always beneath the veil and far from violating the tutelary obscurity Philosophy must preserve it and justify it by maintaining, even in its initiatives most faithful to divine stimulations and to the light of conscience, 
the incommensurabilities between nature's drives and charity's demands. This is why the expression Christian philosophy is more contestable, more equivocal than that whose usage I have proposed and which Mr. von Steinbergen rejects, perhaps without justifying his condemnation of an expression whose meaning and whose reason for being have seemed to escape him. If revelation is indispensable for the Christian mystery's reality being known, justification remains universally accessible by the soul of the church to all those who do not sin against the light and against the interior call, even if it be anonymous by presenting itself under form sufficient to a supernaturally salvific option. And as no man is absolutely deprived of this possibility of salvation, we can therefore call Catholic the disposition of mind and of will that a philosopher entirely faithful to his ability and to his duty can effectively determine in whoever remains docile to conscience's solicitations. Also, it is legitimate to call Catholic philosophy the doctrine that makes precise the attitude necessary and sufficient for a human being to be able to participate in the invisible soul of the universal church, even if this being would remain without fault on his part, ignorant of Christ, of his truth and his law. In this sense, we understand that without knowing the empirical history of Christian facts, a person, the philosophical doctrine can correspond to the ontological history that constitutes the order of grace by gratuitously supernatural elevation and redemption of the creature. It is therefore not with a theoretical possibility, the virtuality of an obediential potentiality, that philosophy must finish while closing itself off to all curiosity, to any reality responding to reason's uncoercible wish. Not at all. Does what is normatively possible and factually desirable or even desired find itself realized in some way accessible to our knowledge set effectively in our scope? These questions, Cardinal Deschamps pointed out, emerge from a reasonable being's gut feelings, and it remains reasonable to examine by every means whether a solution can be offered, whether one effectively exists, whether in the case of silence we have to adopt an attitude in conformity to the mystery that renders our consciousness restless and elevates it. Who would dare to say that no methodical ex examination, no rational investigation can extend itself philosophically to the proposal to the discussion of such questions, even when an explicit solution cannot be formulated with precision? Let us not pretend, therefore, that a philosophy of insufficiency remains confined to a vague and sterile concept. Let us not deny the reality of the invisible soul of the church, a dogma whose oral confession would be undone by a refusal to examine what, for invincible ignorance, opens supernatural access to salvation. Let us not neglect to analyze the reasons of hypothetical necessity the First Vatican Council affirms when the Constitution de Fide declares that in the case, which is our own, where the positive vocation of man to supernatural union has been gratuitously realized and imposed, the knowledge of this historical and psychological truth necessarily supposes an explicit revelation. What is necessary derives from a rational analysis and sense speaking hypothetically, the supernatural vocation is recognized as possible. There are therefore consequences reason can analyze in order to enrich the very notion of a possible revelation of a human obligation and of a rigorous responsibility. All of these are truths that follow each other in a strictly rational plan and whose philosophical connections we could still develop. C. If philosophical inquiry, without losing its specifically rational character, can extend itself not to the contingent modalities of the evangelical message, nor to the dogmatic content of revealed teaching, nor to the discoveries of redemptive charity, but to the metaphysical and spiritual core framework that sustains, we can say, the ascensions of the Christian order, is there not still a further progress of philosophical penetration up to the domain of Christian practice, of the life of grace, of those mores that in man himself incarnate, incarnate or imitate the divine mores? 
St. Bernard pointed out that in the theandric life, there is that is a reality. The two spouses, without confusing their being and action, do not make two different parts of the work to be accomplished, said opere individuo totum singuli per agunt. And what is true of the ground of the operation is true in another way of the consciousness we have of it. Deschamps insisted on this double fact. Supernaturalized virtues are insofar as supernatural, unknowable as such. Uh, but they do not cease for that reason being human, conscious under their psychological and moral aspect, accessible to a description of the most delicate and newest not nuances of a perfection that a natural morality would be by itself unable to attain. Is there not something real, something concrete, something humanly lived in that? And if philosophy must extend itself to the entirety of what is true and lived, must it close off its gaze from what is most beautiful in humanity? Therefore, just as speculation can, from its rational point of view, welcome the lights that manifest metaphysical secrets correlative to the specifically Christian truths without intrinsically deriving from them, there are in consciousnesses dormant seeds, seminal virtues that fertilized by grace, which is less a creation than an elevation of pre-existing or embryonic faculties, present to philosophical study a marvelous harvest from which the science of human resources can legitimately enrich itself. One can go even further in this same direction, for there is an aspect of union with God and of the mystical life that does not at all escape philosophical analysis. Since philosophy applies itself not only to the possibles, to essences, to concepts, but to all the realities raised in the concrete offered to our experience and constituting the lived history of souls, the spectacle and the practice of a Christianity known and lived all the way to its peaks procures a philosophically assimilable surplus of ideas, of feelings, of aspirations. It is good to make actual. For in the light of faith, certain truths not entirely impenetrable to thought contribute a rational solution to only half-glimpsed problems. Certain delicacies of feeling, certain heroism, certain sacrifices enrich human consciousness by making moral effort profit from grace's aid and sublimities. And it is very important that in a society that Christianity has secularly worked on and elevated a philosophically attentive critique prevent a double abuse. First, that which would consist in secularizing and monopolizing the specifically Christian virtues as if they resulted from a natural progress of civilization. Second, that which, to the contrary, would consist in judging chimerical or inhuman, the humility, the asceticism, the follies of the cross. All these aspirations and these immolations that have possibility and signification only by grace and in view of the supernatural elevation of man. Six, there's a little six there. Mr. von Steinbergen, who's spoken to us of broad theology, stretching his gaze and his control over all intellectual culture and all civilization, would he not accept, following our preceding explanations, one just as favorably envisaging a broad philosophy which, faithful to its formal and rational principle, extends itself as far as the universe, as far as humanity, as far as the soul of the church, as far as man, without ceasing to be man, can go towards his supreme destiny. If he attributes to theology a right of total perspective without recognizing thereby the autonomy of any of the sciences and natural disciplines, is it not logical to welcome also the idea of a philosophy that by a reciprocal benefice from its rigorous point of view envisages a field of metaphysical truth, of historical reality, of enlivening charity? By one word without justifying this exclusion, Mr. von Steinbergen dispenses with the expression Catholic philosophy, which in any case was not under discussion at Juvisy. However, according to a remark of St. Augustine himself, is not this term more comprehensive and more precise than all the rest, since it is applied to complete and comprehensive truth under whatever aspect one envisages, envisages it. He objects to us that it suffices to speak of true philosophy constructed outside of the knowledge of Christ, but is it true that we could make a complete and comprehensive use of our reason or of our will without encountering, without implicitly resolving the problem that puts into question our attitude towards him 
even if unnamed, who illuminates, attracts, and strengthens everyone coming into the world. There are some faithful among those whom one calls in fora externo, infidels, and it is not without sinning against the light that they can be they can be condemned. Ita ut sint inexcusabiles. The title Christian, insofar as it refers directly to historical reality, is actually too restrictive, and it applies to some who do not merit it. The title Catholic, which some reproach me for having used in two apparently equivocal senses, embraces to the contrary the entire truth from some point of the horizon and under some anonymous form, whatever it may be, ideas and persons who participate in a right direction, in a good intention, in a salvific aspiration. We have said that revealed assertions and philosophical theses never fuse in a material concordism. This fundamental restriction does not prevent, but rather permits the double use of the word Catholic, understood in a unique sense as what concerns truth that is life-given, but diversified in what bears on the methods and the paths of access to salvation. What would drag in ruinous confusions would be the obstinacy that would make, want to make a philosophy a fixed mass of concepts to be made to agree with Christian dogmatics. But the true philosophy is, to the contrary, that which not only remains open and plastic, but contributes to the entirety of life to illuminate it just as to be illuminated by it. Therefore, as much as we can associate ourselves with Mr. von Steinbergen's severity against the false concordism of Christian philosophies, just as much and, and more, it would be wrong and fatal to isolate anew the two spiritual powers who would claim autonomous and exclusive rule over minds and souls. No more than that of concordats, the regime of separation is not normal or wise. What is true is at the same time and together, a heterogeneity and a spontaneous and method method methodical cooperation. If philosophy ignores or eliminates the intellectual or moral dispositions that respond to the demands of faith, it is not true. It becomes harmful. In order to help us understand the delicate equilibrium of attitudes to reconcile, Mr. von Steinbergen proposes to us an allegory, that of a, a spectator who completes his direct vision of a far-off horizon with that of a map where the various objects to be discerned are found. But this is, again, a visual concordism that does not get us out of a single and same order of similar data. Another analogy would seem to be in greater conformity to the exact complexity of the problem. Words are sung with the accompaniment of the orchestra. Without the libretto, I do not discover the signification, nor even the exact words. But the visual images, without adding anything to the sonorous images, since they are of another order, still give to what I hear already and to what I could even taste without understanding enough, a precision, a beauty, a perfect certainty. Perhaps, despite the deficiency of the comparison, we might say that the interior and far-off song of reason and of grace is not, however, entirely indecipherable and without efficacy. But the revelation and the very spectacle of the church procure to those who receive its benefits the means of discerning the exact meaning of reason's lessons and of divine solicitations without, for that reason, the calls or the responses, the efforts or the aids, being confused or being made of double use, those that in different ways contribute to the sole truth, the sole destiny, the sole solution. Perhaps these brief remarks will suggest the idea that the problem of Catholic philosophy, already illu usefully illuminated by so many efforts, is not as cut and dried and simple as many are brought to believe today. It seems we must divide the difficulty and examine it along several superimposed planes. So uh, that's the end of Maurice Blondel's For an Integral Philosophy. I was smiling a little bit because, you know, we're 44 minutes into this. These brief remarks, right? Uh, they're not really brief remarks. There's a lot packed in there. I do want to say something, too, before I, I well, let me, let me say hello to everybody who's, who's weighing in here. Blondel not only wrote that by dictation, and had to, because he was nearly blind at the time. He's responding to other people's pieces that he also couldn't read, that were read to him by his secretary, 
who he, he then would, you know, dictate to. Blondell must have had an, a very prodigious, not only memory, but capacity for connecting and associating all these things in his mind. Uh, because even, you know, even having translated this and reading it aloud, I have a hard time keeping all the things straight that he's saying, let alone their reference in other people's writing. So it's pretty incredible, this, you know, what, what Blondell was able to accomplish. Um, I mean, he, he, his vision started failing him in the 1920s. And, um, you know, he's found his secretary who he can work with by this time. Thomas says, was Blondell a practicing Catholic? Was he going to mass receiving communion? Yes, very much so. As a matter of fact, many of the main people involved in these debates were um, Etienne Gilson and um, Jacques Moratin and Gabriel Marcel, other really important um, people in the debates, all lay people, all very devoted Catholics. Uh, Moratin and uh, Marcel, both converts actually, um, Blondel and, and uh, Gilson would be what we call cradle Catholics, both of whom decided to, instead of like going into the Catholic ghetto of the Institutes Catholique or things like that, decided to uh, participate in the very secular, anti-Catholic um, French philosophical establishment. Um, Blondel actually considered a priestly vocation for a while, and uh, then decided to become what he called a lay apostle in philosophy. So, yeah. Mark says uh, two broad questions. Um, what do I think Blondell's biggest contribution to these debates across these four readings? Um, stressing the importance of a philosophy of insufficiency. Of, you know, that, that Blondell was working with this from the very beginning in Oxio 1893 and then in the letter on apologetics, um, you know, during the modernist crisis, he stressed that philosophy, if it was going to be genuinely philosophical, did need to exercise its own autonomy, not only in re relation to religion, but also in relation to other fields. So he would have been, you know, against, say, like the um, positivist project or anything like that. And he knew positivism, not through the logical positivist, but through Comte and, and his successors. Um and so philosophy needs to be truly aware of its own insufficiencies, its failings, the gaps within it. And that is what opens it up to the possibility of assimilating what it can, learning from uh, Christianity, the supernatural, right? Without that, Blondell thought you wind up in a couple different problematic aspects. You notice he talks a lot about conceptualism or buttoning itself up in concepts, but also taking in Revelation as one of the great uh, uh, metaphors that he has, like a packet of wounding spines, right? Uh, think about taking a sea urchin and shoving it into your flesh, right? So I would say that that is probably the most important um, contribution. And that's recognized by many of the other people in the debates. You notice um, De Solage, you notice uh, Sirtiange, you notice all these other people that I haven't put in the book because, uh, you know, they we can only translate so many and put them in there. Uh, that's what they recognize. Um, Mark says, do, how do his ideas and these contributions relate to his ideas conveyed in Oxium 1893 and the interesting correlations? Yeah, you could say that Blondell's project um, begins before Oxium 1893, which is, of course, his second dissertation. He has to write a French dissertation and a Latin dissertation at the time. And Oxium 1893 is his, uh, his French dissertation. It almost gets him blackballed from teaching because uh, people feel that he's smuggling in religion. But he's trying to show that philosophy, uh, if it takes itself really seriously, has to extend itself to and has to open itself up to the possibility of religion of and, and specifically of Christianity. I mean, I think that you could go further with this and say that, you know, maybe Christianity shouldn't be the only religion that philosophy has to have a similar, um, you know, relation to in this respect, but, um, you know, maybe, maybe many others, um, not necessarily every single, 
uh, religious aspect, but certainly some of them. So, yeah, so that, those are some some good questions. I mean, Blondell's work, Axiom, is going to get revised later on. Um, so, yeah, any any other questions, comments, um, thing, thoughts this has provoked? You know, this is, as I mentioned, this is the second to last um one that we're going to be going into. I'm going to show you the table of contents real quick. So we are getting close to the very end. You see Blondell's thing there. Leon Noel is next. I'm not going to read the bibliography to you. That would be extremely boring. <laughs> you know? um, so, all right. Thomas Girard, who would be a thinker who took up Blondell's torch? Was anyone directly influenced by him? Thousands of people were directly influenced by him. He is often called the philosopher of Vatican II. Um, <clears throat> Transcendental Thomism, uh, starting with like Joseph Marischal, is heavily engaged with Blondell. You'll find references to him in Rahner, in Lonergan, and in others as well. Um, there was actually a contribution made in the debates uh, looking at Blondell and um, Husserl by Joseph Marischal. And you recall, of course, that Joseph Marischal was one of the people who um, was engaged in Blondell's um, session with the Société d'Etudes Philosophie. Um, let me see if I can find this Marshall piece. Um, and, and then he's just one. Yeah, here we go. It's uh, Phenomenolo Femin Phenomenologie pure ou ou philosophie d'action in uh, philosophie perennis, abhandlungen zur ihre Vergangenheit in Gegenwart, um, published in sort of a Feschrift, right? Uh, who else is influenced by Blondel? All the Nouveau Theology people, you know, which would include Henri de Lubac. Um, there's also, you know, some of the people involved in this debate. Antonin Sertillage is drawing from Blondel. Um, if you've ever read John Paul II's, you know, the Pope's uh, Fides et Ratio, the piece on Christian philosophy, Blondel is not mentioned there. And somebody pointed out that. Um, that's because the entire document is drawing on Blondell's perspective. So, you know, Blondell, it, it was massively influential. Um, Mark, would I ever consider doing a reading series like this about my PhD? I'd be interested to hear more about Blondell. Well, you, if you mean my dissertation, my dissertation, it, it was not a document that I was really happy with. It was kind of a, a mishmash of really three different things that probably should have been done you know, in separation from each other. It's also in word perfect. So I would have to convert it to word. So I don't think I'll probably ever do that. Absalom. The problem for Western Bible readers today is we don't think like ancient Jews from their mindset, they could have easily more found an explanation of how could Jonah survive in a whale. Totally irrelevant to this and uh, generalizing in, in super broad senses about uh, how people read things. There's, there's, you know, dozens of hermeneutics out there today, many of which actually, you know, are attuned to thinking, trying to think the way that, I mean, it's what we call form criticism, right? So yeah, not, not really ref, uh, uh, relevant to this. Um, any other questions, comments? We had about another seven minutes um, about the book, about Blondell, about the debates, you know, any of that sort of stuff. All right, so Mark says, from a Christian perspective, do you think a full love of Christ is possible without philosophia? Um, well, that's an interesting question. I mean, for the people involved in these debates, philosophia, not in the sense of the discipline of philosophy, but the love of wisdom is, in fact, going to involve love of, you know, what is best and wisdom that can communicate itself. And traditionally, that has been understood to be Christ. As a matter of fact, when you read, you know, for example, the deuterocanonical Jewish text, the wisdom of Solomon and wisdom is personified, there is, you know, debates among Christians. Is this 
the second or the third person of the Trinity, or is this something different, you know, like a highest creature or stuff like that. So, you know, traditionally the, the word, the logos has been understood as, as wisdom. Um, could you say, could you, and we could say, can you do this without explicitly um, focusing on Christ? I would say the answer is yes. And certainly Blondell seems to think the answer is yes, but you're going to get more mileage um, out of it, you know? So yeah, that's, that's a good question. There's a lot, lot more there that could be drawn out. I'll say that there's sort of a, you know, for, for a lot of, um, Christian philosophers, there's a convergence that's going on, you could say. All right, uh, Darth Vader, how important is it to understand Hegel from the point of view of Christianity instead of using his dialectic to filter out all the Christianity from it? It's not important at all to understand Hegel from the point of view of Christianity, I think. Um, it's, you know, Hegel's worth knowing and understanding. Um, he's got some interesting thoughts, rather, you know, idiosyncratic about Christianity. Um, probably the best of his thoughts about it are to be found replicated in Feuerbach. Um, but why would you use his dialectic to filter out all the Christianity from Hegel's views, given that Hegel makes religion and the revealed religion the penultimate to philosophy? Um, that would be anti-Hegel. It would be like betraying Hegel's own point of view. Uh, Thomas, it's interesting how Vatican II drew from these thinkers from the perspective of faith. It's kind of a little green light as far as the philosophy is concerned. Um, not really sure what you mean by a little green light. Um, you know, prior to Vatican II, this is prior to Vatican II, there was an incredible fertility to Catholic philosophy. It wasn't all, um, given the competing views at the time, Garrigou, Lagrange, and all. Garrigou, Lagrange was, was at the lunatic fringe of things. He was not mainstream. Um, people who like, who like to talk about him, I usually just dismiss them. He's got, so he's got a good book on the spiritual life, but when it came to like the debates of the time, Garrigou, Lagrange admitted he like couldn't understand Blondell, but had no problem, you know, condemning him. The mainstream was more people like the ones that are actually in, in this work. You know, Gelson, Maritain, Sertillage, uh, who was massively important at the time. Um, non non uh, um, uh, Thomist philosophers like Etienne Bourne and uh, Mark Shaler and uh, Edith Stein. Well, she kind of is Thomist in a way. Um, Maurice Blondel, of course, you know, Gabriel Marcel were massively important as well. Um, all right, Darth Vader, what do you think of somebody like Zizek's reading of Christianity? I don't know what Zizek's reading of Christianity is because Zizek's all over the map all the time. Um, I don't know that he has a coherent reading of, of Christianity as far as I can tell. So, and it's, you know, doesn't have anything to do with the more rigorous stuff that you find here. So. All right, any other questions? We've got about two more minutes left. Okay. Um, well, I'm waiting to see if anybody has anything to say. So one more session, and we're going to be reading Leia Noel's uh, piece, which is drawing on Husserl, by the way, interestingly the notion of Christian philosophy. Um, Daniel, how does the new, does the Nouvelle Theologie emerge from this debate? No, it emerges from people who are reading the people who are in this debate. The debate itself already involves, you know, Henri de Lubeck at the end of it. So uh, Darth Vader, how important is Kierkegaard in the history of Christianity? You know, kind of important, kind of not important. Like, like so many figures, he's pretty late in the history of Christianity, right? Um, he's interesting. He's got a lot of cool stuff to say. Um, a lot of what he has to say, when you look at it, is not totally original. He doesn't claim that it actually is. I mean, he, in, in philosophical fragments, he's like begging the reader's um, pardon for not 
being original and, and just saying stuff that Lactantius or Luther or people like that said. Thomas Girard, is this a fruit of Attorney Patris? Attorney Patris is a um, uh, papal encyclical back in the 1800s. Yeah, it's partly, uh, it, it's, it's not a fruit of it. It's certainly coming out of a, uh, a milieu in which Attorney Patris put Thomism back on the map. Um, and spurred an interest in in neo scholasticism. Um, I talk about the Aeterni Patris in the historical introduction, um, in the uh, general background and the debates French context. So, all right. Well, it is one o'clock. I got to get some other work. We'll be doing one more of these uh, next week. And that will end this, uh, this series that I started back in the summer, in the fall, in 2011, because uh, the book is now, you know, 10 years old. So, all right, I'll see all of you next time, hopefully, and uh, good conversation.